What is up everyone? In this video series, we will be making a huge upgrade to my video editing storage solution. So up until now, I've always edited locally. The projects and the files that I work on are directly connected to the machine. At the moment and in recent years, that has been an external SSD connected via USB 3.0. It works okay, but it's definitely time for an upgrade. Now, I think a lot of people are in a similar situation to me. You're working on a project, maybe you've got a smaller sized external drive connected to your machine. Maybe you use multiple external drives or SSDs hanging from adapters, and it all just gets a little bit confusing. You've got to remember to empty those drives, make room for your new project. You're constantly running out of space. And then things aren't quite as flexible as you'd like them. So maybe you want to share some footage with someone or you want to access that footage from a different machine. Things get very complicated and very annoying extremely quickly. So I'm going to be finally making the transition and editing all of my videos from a NAS, a network attached storage device. So in order to do this successfully for video editing specifically or any task that requires a high bandwidth and lots of speed, we need to beef up the home network. So currently I've got a pretty nice home network, but it still maxes out at only one gigabit per second ethernet. For this project, we're going to be beefing that up all the way to 10 gigabit per second ethernet. So that's the first step. Secondly, we actually need the box that's going to make all this happen. And in this case, it is a high capacity NAS that is quick enough to keep up with the task of video editing. So I do currently have a couple of NAS devices on my home network, but they're not quick enough to actually edit from. They're quick enough to store data and you can retrieve data from them as and when you need. So all my finished videos are stored there. All of my archived footage is stored there, but you can't actually work directly from it, at least not in 1080p or 4K. It needs to be much more capable in order to allow that to happen. So they're the upgrades we're going to be making. And I've never done this before. I've never deployed a 10 gigabit ethernet network and I've never edited directly from a NAS. So I'm going to be learning all of this completely at the same time as you guys. I'm going to take you along for the ride. If you're looking to do this yourselves, hopefully you'll learn a few things. And in this video, I'm going to be using QNAP equipment. I'd like to say a massive thank you to QNAP for providing this equipment for me to be able to demonstrate it to you guys in these videos. I'm going to have some great fun digging in and checking out those products. So without further ado, let's take a little look at the kit we're going to need to make this happen. We're hopefully going to end up with a really, really speedy video editing network. So here's all the gear for this project. We have a QNAP TSH973AX 9-bay NAS based on the AMD Ryzen platform with 10 gigabit Ethernet networking capabilities. We also have a new switch that I'm going to be adding to my network. This is the QNAP QSWM8044C. That's an 8-port fully managed 10 gigabit Ethernet switch. We have also got seven drives to put into the NAS. So we're going to be putting in five hard drives, so completely populating all of the three and a half inch bays. And we'll also be putting in two SSDs to accompany them. So let's unbox. I think we'll start with the switch and then we'll save the best until last. So this component is sort of vital for us here. Now, if you have an existing 10 gigabit per second ethernet network, then you're absolutely golden, you're good to go. You can plug a 10 gigabit per second ethernet uh, device straight into it and you can take advantage of those speeds right away. For me, I don't currently have that luxury, so having this switch on my network will allow me to be able to switch between 10 gig ethernet devices 
at full speed. It's also worth mentioning that you don't necessarily have to connect a NAS to your home network right away. If you want to do a project like this in two stages, you can get the NAS first and you can just use a direct connection between your NAS and whatever system you're editing on for the time being until you can get a switch and get it up and running on a network or just use it like that indefinitely because you will still get the advantages of redundancy and all the lovely features that are built into the NAS. You just won't get those features achievable on the network so you won't be able to really access it very easily from other systems. It won't talk to all the other gear on your network and all that sort of thing. So the switch just kind of ties it all together. So let's take a little look at what we've got. We've got some paper documentation here, including a quick installation guide. Next up, we have a power cable. This is a standard UK IEC cable. So that tells me right away that this guy has a built-in power supply, which is very nice because it isn't the biggest switch in the world. It's not completely 19 inches wide. So it's nice that they were able to squeeze the power supply in there. Next up, we have our rack ears. So if you do want to rack mount this guy, you can do that right out of the box. And we've also got, ah, another one. So that was, hang on a second, let's have a look. Ah, just one rack ear and another one. I thought this was two because it was so chunky. It's got this nice sort of corner brace. So that's really good. I used to have an old switch that mounted in my rack and it had very flimsy rack ears and the whole switch just used to droop back in the rack. So it's quite nice to see how robust those mounts are. We'll get this switch mounted in the rack later on in the series. So let's get it out of the box and take a look at it. Aha, we've got some other goodies underneath. These are some feet that you can stick onto the bottom of the switch if you're going to keep it um, simply sitting on a desk or sitting on a shelf somewhere. If you don't have a rack, you can pop these feet onto the switch. It'll stop it from sliding around. And also in there, if you can just about make that out through the bag, we've got our screws to attach the rack ears. So the first thing that I notice about the switch is the solid metal construction. So it's pretty much all metal. We've got a little bit of plastic on the front here and it's uh, kind of glossy. Um, but it is a very nice looking device, very sleek. It would not look out of place on a shelf in your office or in your studio, um, but it will look really nice equally in a rack as well. So let's take a little look around the device. First of all, on the back, we have got the power socket. Again, built-in power supply, so no transformer required. You can power it directly from your UPS or PDU or whatever. Very nice and convenient there. Um, a management port, gigabit ethernet port on the back for management, as well as a console port. Won't be using either of those in this particular setup. Next up, we have a little uh, reset button on the back and a Kensington security lock. On the side, we've got left to right cooling or right to left cooling, so sideways on this guy, which is great because it's not completely 19 inches wide. So even in a rack that may be quite restrictive on the sides, you'd still get a fair bit of airflow because there is a good gap between the sides of the switch and the rest of the 19 inch width of the rack. So two cooling fans, apparently this is meant to be really quiet in operation, which is nice because the cumulative sound of all of my devices in the rack is kind of loud. So it's nice not to add anything to that. On this side opposite the fans, we've got a nice vent. So presumably um, at a guess, they are exhaust fans and the cool air is drawn in through this side and then exhausted out through the fans on this side. So looking at the front panel, we have got a power status LED, I believe that will be. And then we have all of our LEDs for the ports. So all of the ports are over this end and all the LEDs are over here. I like this layout um, as opposed to the switches where you've got the lights on the ports themselves because it's much easier to see it like this, in my opinion. You can just reference a port so you can say uh, port five, what's it doing? You know, and you can look at the LED as opposed to moving your patch cables out the way and trying to find the LED that's corresponding to that port. I like this design where the LEDs and the ports are separated out. That's really nice. Then we've just got as I say, this glossy plastic on the front. And then this is where all the business happens. So at a glance, it looks like a 12 port switch, but when you look more closely, you realize it's an eight port. You simply have a choice with ports five, six, seven, and eight, whether you use RJ45 or SFP+. So ports one through four are always SFP+. So you've got four SFP plus ports on the device. And next up, that's when you get either RJ45 
or SFP+. So you have a choice here. You can use any combination. You could have four RJ45 devices and you could have four SFP Plus devices, or you could have seven SFP Plus and then just one RJ45. Whatever works in your setup, you could always as well just use RJ45. And that's what's kind of magical about this type of kit at the moment. It was so expensive for the longest time to get a 10 gig ethernet network set up anywhere outside of a commercial space. But thanks to these sorts of switches that are coming on the market, You've got these RJ45 ports that are capable of 10 gig ethernet using standard ethernet cabling. It is so convenient and so affordable to do this now. So because of these ports, you can just slot this into any network. And as long as you're using a Cat6 or above cable, you can achieve those 10 gig ethernet speeds. So a little note on that, I think Cat6, standard Cat6 cabling is good for 10 gig ethernet runs up to, I believe, 45 meters with this switch. If you're going over 45 meters, you've got to start looking at Cat6A cabling, or maybe even Cat7, you can just keep going up, I suppose. If I was buying fresh cabling and installing this as a brand new network, I'd probably just go up to Cat7 straight away so I knew everything was good. But I believe Cat6 will work just fine. So we'll try this with Cat6 and Cat7 to see if there is a difference. But this guy should do 10 gig ethernet over Cat6 through these ports, I do believe, because 45 meters is one heck of a run. I don't have any runs in my house that are as long as 45 meters but of course if you are installing this in more of a commercial setting an office building or whatever and your server room is quite far away from whatever machines you'll be using then you'll have possibly longer runs than 45 meters so these are indeed sfp plus ports so you get 10 gig on these guys and the rj45 ports these will do 10 gig ethernet as well but they'll also drop down to 5 gig 2.5 gig, 1 gig, or even 100 meg. So this really does integrate with any device that you could possibly throw at it. Now the switching capacity of this guy is 160 gigabits per second, which is really colossal. So you can maximize the potential of all eight ports on this guy, and it will switch happily between all of those devices at a full 10 gig speed, which is incredible. So lastly, a little point on management. This is a layer two managed switch and it's managed through QNAP's QSS system, which is QNAP switch system. Uh, it's a web graphical user interface that you can access through any browser. It should be a really nice process. I'm looking forward to checking it out and seeing what the user friendliness of it is like and everything. I've got kind of high hopes for this. I've never used a QNAP switch before, but I think it's gonna be really sweet. And another quick point to mention also is if this switch doesn't quite fit the bill for what you're planning, there are several switches available in the range. So one important point is you can get a completely unmanaged version of this. So you can get all these features such as the SFP Plus and the RJ45 is capable of up to 10 gig ethernet. You can get it in an unmanaged package. So if you just wanna plug everything in and have it work straight away, even though this will be plug and play out of the box, uh, if you just wanna maybe save a little bit and you don't need the management side, you can go for an unmanaged switch. Similarly, if you need a little bit more, maybe you need more ports, there are switches like this with more ports available. There's a big range. Um, I'll put some links down in the video description. I'll put a link to this switch and a few other useful links down there to sort of the broader range of switches that are available from QNAP. Um, so if you wanna build your entire home network around the QNAP 10 gig switch, you can do that extremely easily. And I keep saying home network. Really, we are discussing any kind of network here at this point, you know, up to quite a professional level. So anyway, that is the switch. Excited to check that out. Let's dig in to the NAS. This is the QNAP TSH973AX, the eight gigabyte model. They ship both an eight gigabyte and a 32 gigabyte model, but if you do get the eight gig, the RAM is upgradable further on down the road. We'll take a little look at that in a minute on the device itself. So this is a bit of a beast. Let's dig in and see exactly what we've got. It has been a while since I've unboxed a NAS, and this is my first ever QNAP NAS, so I'm very excited to check it out. This is a nice little touch on the inside of the box. Welcome, thank you for choosing QNAP. We hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed making it. That's really nice. First things first, I notice we have quite a large external power brick. Now I mentioned on the switch unboxing that it's nice that the switch had an internal power supply. This guy has an external power supply, but that also has its advantages as well. If your power supply ever goes, hey, you're just sending this in instead of sending in your whole system to get it replaced. You can also buy a secondary power supply as a backup and just keep it on the shelf so that if your power supply ever goes, then you can just swap it out straight away and be up and running within five minutes or so. So there's an advantage to 
having an external power supply as well as having an internal power supply. Standard IEC connection on the power brick itself and an IEC cable to go with it, of course. In here we have a network cable lurking. It is a nice blue cable. Let's take a look at what cable it is. We've also got some documentation in this bag as well. And we have screws. So a nice lot of screws there, presumably to screw in our SSDs, but we'll check that out in a minute. There's our warranty card, five year warranty, as well as the quick installation guide for the NAS. Let's take a look at this included network cable. So it's about one meter, maybe 1.5 meters long, nice Cat6 shielded cable. Really nice to have that in the box to get you up and running straight away. So that's it for the accessories and Next up, we just have the NAS itself. So when I hear nine bay NAS, I immediately think of quite a large system, but actually holding this and unboxing it, I realized just how compact this is. This is a very nice desktop form factor and you get nine drives in here. So as you can see, sitting on top of my rack here, it really is quite a compact system. So before we have a tour around the device, we'll go over some of the specs really quickly because it is an extremely impressive machine. So the CPU in this guy is the AMD Ryzen V1500B. That's a quad core CPU, eight threads, 64 bit of course, and it's running at 2.2 gigahertz. So there's a lot of power under the hood for this guy. This, as I mentioned, is the eight gigabyte model. It runs DDR4 memory, but you can put up to, I believe, 32 gigabytes in here using two identical 16 gigabyte SODIMs. This NAS runs the QUTS Hero operating system. I've never owned a QNAP NAS before, so I've never used any of their operating systems. So we'll be learning that one together. But QUTS Hero is their most advanced NAS operating system. And it also utilizes the ZFS file system. So yes, this NAS is indeed a ZFS box, which is incredible. So, so many benefits. ZFS consumes a little bit more memory, so it's expandable up to 32 gigs. You get 32 gigs in here, or even 16 gigs, you can use all of those lovely ZFS features. For us, eight gigabytes will be totally fine. Um, the use case for us on this NAS is gonna be fairly straightforward with video editing. We just need to get it as stable and as quick as possible, configured appropriately for our needs. Um, but this can do so much more than what we're gonna touch on in this series. So this is a nine bay NAS, and there are quite a few different options for drive installations in this box. So first of all, at the top, we have our three and a half inch hard drive bays. There are one, two, three, four, five SATA six gigabit per second, three and a half inch bays, primarily designed to hold your mechanical hard drives, three and a half inches in size for your mass storage. So your multi terabyte drives are gonna go in here. You can get a lot of raw capacity in a tiny box. Of course, you can put SSDs in here as well if you want to, but we do have dedicated two and a half inch SSD bays underneath. So the remaining four bays that brings us to the total of nine bays are all two and a half inch SSD bays. They all support SATA six gigabit per second connectivity for your standard SATA SSDs. But a wonderful feature about this box is in slots one and two, you do have the option to populate them with a U2 NVMe SSD, one in slot one, one in slot two. Now that is an enterprise grade SSD, very fast, very reliable, and it utilizes the PCIe Gen 3 X4 interface. So these slots are compatible with both the SATA six gigabit per second and the PCIe Gen 3 X4 slots for those two and a half inch U2 drives. Now, U2 drives aren't something that you come across every day. They're nowhere near as common as SATA SSDs, uh, but they are out there. They are available to purchase and you can pop them in here for some incredibly fast and reliable SSD performance. Coming over here, we've got, we've got a little bit of plastic here. Let's see if we can peel this off. Here we go. Peel that off the QNAP logo and also away from the LEDs there. I believe we have various indicator lights down here. We'll see when we power it on um, to check out the status of drives, network status, things like that. So lastly on the front, we've got a couple of buttons. We've got the power button, and we've also got what looks to be some kind of copy button on the front with this USB port. So I'm guessing you can plug some kind of drive in the front and copy things just by pressing the button. That's really cool. This USB port, it may just look like a plain old USB 3 port, but it is in fact a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port. So you will get 10 gigabit per second through these USB ports as well, which is fantastic to have right on the front of the box. So before we spin it around and have a look at the back, I wanna remove some of these hard drive bays so that we can take a look at them. So this is the bay. It's all plastic, extremely lightweight, but very, very rugged. And I believe we've just got these little rails that snap off 
Aha, yes. So we just take those off the sides, put the drive in, and then presumably just click them back into place. So a toolless mounting system for the drives. There we go. They just click back into place. That's really nice. And we've also got anti-vibration rubber mounting for the drives on the side there as well. So let's take out these bays. So looking inside the device, you can see the massive fan at the back to cool all of this stuff. You can also see the very neat and tidy SATA connectors there, all very neatly arranged, not a cable in sight. And most importantly in here, just to the side, we can see our memory module, our SODIM is in there, as well as the second slot to upgrade the RAM. So let's just have a little nose at these smaller bays. These are our nice little SSD bays, and presumably a similar affair inside here. So it's quite dark in there, but you can catch a glimpse of the U2 slots slash standard SATA as well, so backwards compatible there. So looking on the bottom quickly, I just want to point out these rubber feet. They're extremely thick and sturdy, but they are also quite squashy, so they should absorb a little bit of the vibration from the drives when this is sitting on the desk or on the work surface or whatever. Um, they're nice robust rubber feet. Obviously this will be quite weighty when it's fully loaded, so it's nice you can barely move it. They are doing their job. It's actually quite difficult to turn around on the rubber feet. We have to lift it up and oh, wow, look at the size of that fan. So I've got massive hands and yeah, that fan is absolutely huge. So on the back, we can see all of our ports. We've got our connector for the power supply, the external power supply right there. We've got a little reset button. This is where the magic happens. This is a 10 gigabit ethernet port, copper port. So any RJ45 cable, Cat6, Cat6A, Cat7, connect straight into that switch that I showed you earlier. Absolutely wonderful, no messing around with fiber, no messing around with expensive cabling. It's all right there, just a normal copper connection. Absolutely lovely. Up here we have two further network connections. Believe it or not, these aren't just one gig ethernet. As if having the 10 gig ethernet isn't enough, you've also got two 2.5 gig ethernet ports on the back and they can use lag. So you can aggregate these two ports to get five gigabits per second. Two two and a half gig ports as well as the 10 gig. That's brilliant. And we've got two more of those wonderful USB ports, the USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports up to 10 gigabits per second, and one up here in the form of a little USB-C port, that's 3.2 as well. So ports, IO on this thing, very, very capable. So much throughput in and out of this box. So on paper, this guy is an absolute beast. The specs are incredible. And one really nice thing is this is ready out of the box. You can bung your drives in and turn it on. The 10 gig connection is built right onto the machine. There's no PCI card that you've got to buy separately and slot in and screw down and then put the cover on or whatever. This guy is ready and you can either buy it with eight gigs of RAM or if you want more RAM, if you're gonna take advantage of some of the more beefy ZFS features that require a lot of memory, you can get the 32 gigabyte version, or you can upgrade the RAM yourself. It is all here for you, ready to rock and roll. So I think we should populate this thing with some high capacity drives and also some SSDs. So now that we've taken a look at the two main pieces of equipment that we'll be using for this project, it's time to touch on storage, which is a very important part. Without storage, even if you've got a lovely all singing, all dancing mass, it's not gonna do much without drives. So for drives in this guy, we're gonna be populating all of the three and a half inch drive bays with mechanical storage. And we have right here today, the Western Digital WD Red Pro drives. These are the 10 terabyte versions. So the raw capacity of spinning mechanical storage in this box will be 50 terabytes. Of course, factoring in RAID, we'll look at that in part two, factoring in RAID will have less usable capacity, but will also have redundancy and still loads of storage because five, 10 terabyte disks. It's gonna be really nice. So on top of the mechanical storage, we're also gonna utilize two out of the four SSD bays. And I do have a couple of Western Digital SSDs to put in there. These are the WD Red SA500 SSDs. So these are designed specifically for a NAS device just like this. Two 500 gigabyte drives, one terabyte in total. As I say, we'll configure all this in part two. So stay tuned for part two where we'll actually set this up and you can see how I configure these drives. Choosing the storage, choosing the appropriate drives to use for a project like this is I'd say more difficult than choosing the hardware itself. You've really got to think about how much space you're going to use. Now this will be ample space for me. This is overkill and it's going to be really speedy too, nice high performance drives, but 
you don't necessarily need a huge amount of storage on an active video editing box. Now, it all depends on the kind of style that you do, how much of your footage that you record that you end up using. I have a great luxury because I just record YouTube videos here and I've got a single camera setup. I primarily record in 1080p, so even that in itself doesn't use a lot of space, but I will be experimenting more with 4K as time moves on. Um, but for me, I use, say, 70, 75% of the footage I record. 70% of the footage I record goes into the final product. So that is a really efficient workflow. But it's not like that for everyone. It's not like that for every style. Um, it's not surprising, it's not unheard of to only use, say, 5% or even less of the footage that you record. But to edit that video, you need to import it all. All of that footage needs to sit on your scratch disk. And if you're doing 4K, if you're doing multicam, that storage gets eaten up really quickly. So maybe an e economical approach to do this would be to spec out the active NAS for only the projects that you're gonna to need to store on it at any one time. So let's say for instance, on your current setup, you only use about 15 terabytes. You're a full-time video editor and month to month you use 15, 20 terabytes. Maybe specking out a 30 terabyte NAS will be ample for you for ages going forward because what you can do is then move all of your finished products somewhere else. You can move it to cold storage, or you can move it to a secondary NAS that's maybe a lower spec machine but has high capacity of maybe lesser performing drives, but you can use it as a big kind of storage box for everything that you may need to access in the future. Um, also, some people just delete everything and only keep the final exports. In that case, it's much, much more space efficient just to keep those. So it all depends. It's, it's a very personal thing. It depends how you work. Of course, maybe the easiest thing is just to spec out a NAS like this and put the absolute maximum amount of storage in it you can afford. And then that way you can just keep chugging away. And then when it's full, maybe look at deleting stuff. But hey, it's all down to the specific use case scenario for me. This is great. This combined with my other network attached storage devices, I'll have storage for video going forward for a long time. So I am sorted, but we will see how much storage we actually end up using for different projects that I'm gonna test out later on in the series. We'll probably do some testing in part three, show you some speed and also talk more about storage because I do understand that choosing the storage is definitely a difficult process for something like this, especially when you're splashing out so much on something that you're maybe not 100% sure on. So let's stop talking and put the drives in this box. So I think we'll start with the hard drives. Now these are the largest capacity drives that I've ever held in my hands. I've got eight terabyte drives in my previous most powerful NAS, but these just take it to the next level. So I'm gonna have my first go at these nice toolless drive sleds, pop the sides off. One there. One there. Pop the drive in, just like that sits on there really nicely. And then we should just be able to click these sides back on. Aha, okay. That is nice. Okay, four clicks, one for each screw hole, and that drive is in. That is not going anywhere. You can also secure it with, it looks like three screws on the bottom here. So two here, and one here. So if you want to screw it in as well as use the toolless system, you can do that. Nice. Let's have a look and see how the SSD mounting works. Let's pull out our little SSD. Now this is also a first for me, my first ever SSD going into a NAS. Up until now, I've only had mechanical drives and I'm looking forward to checking out the advantages of having an SSD in my NAS. It appears like we have some kind of toolless design here as well. We may just be able to snap this in. Man, look at that, that is cool. I just pushed it in. Let's see if I can redo that. We just pop it in and it sits in place like that. How cool is that? And again, that is not going anywhere. Nice. Slide the SSD in and we are good to go. That is the entire NAS populated in well under five minutes. 
I like tool lists when it's done right, and that is easy. So, what does 51 terabytes feel like? Ooh, nice. Not as bad as I thought. Okay, that's good. Quick note, when you're populating a NAS with drives, it's a good idea to take a little photograph of each label in order, and then after you've sorted your NAS out, set it up, knock up a little spreadsheet of what drive is in what bay with its serial number, get your warranties sorted and registered or whatever the case may be, just so you've got a nice record of what's in here. Because if the drive does go, you want it to be as easy as possible to whip it out, get it sent off, get your replacement and pop it back in. So that is one populated NAS. All we've got to do now is plug it in. So to get all this equipment configured, I'm gonna do a little temporary test setup outside of my rack first of all, just to make sure everything's working before we start tearing away at all the cables and whatnot in my rack and creating all sorts of commotion. I'm gonna configure all of this outside of the rack. Once we have a setup that I'm happy with and a configuration that's working well, I'll then tear everything apart and make it all neat and tidy and integrate the new equipment into my existing network. But for now, we're gonna do a little external setup and this is the way that it's gonna be while we're configuring it. So right away, we are gonna hook this up into my existing network. So to do that, I've got this handy little DAC cable that I prepared earlier. This is plugged into my existing network switch and all we're gonna do is we're gonna plug this into port number one on the QNAP switch and that will now chat to my main network, which is great. Next up, we need a cable to connect our lovely new high-speed NAS to the new high-speed switch. So this included cable that came with the NAS. We're going to plug that into the 10G port on the back. And we're going to go for port number one on the switch. There we go. So two out of our eight ports currently populated. So the final thing that we need to actually hook up is a machine. We need to hook up a computer to this switch. Now, of course, I will be able to access this switch and this NAS because we have a link to my main network. Whatever system is connected to my main network will now by default out of the box be able to see all of this once it's powered up anyway. But what I want to do is connect directly to the switch because that will allow me to get 10 gig speeds. If I currently use the setup that we have, I'll only get one gig speed because as I mentioned, earlier my main home network is limited to one gig ethernet so for that i've got a brand new cat 7 cable for now we're just going to drape this across the floor but later on in the video we will install this alongside my current cat 6 cable that's running to my desk and that will allow us to be able to test speeds cat 6 versus cat 7 see if there's any difference at this relatively short distance i believe this is a 10 meter cable so we're just going to plug this into the switch right now and this will allow us to plug in our machine there we go of course we need power for all of this stuff so let's plug in the power brick and we can flip this guy around here we go and our two uk iec cables you can plug those in down there one for the nas and one for the switch so it may not look the prettiest but this is only our temporary test setup and configuration setup outside of the rack so that is everything we need prepared and hooked up ready to rock so we're going to do that all in part two i'd love to power it on right now and just carry on but i've got to get this part one out to you guys i hope you've enjoyed up until now please stay tuned for part two. It's going to be loads of fun. We're going to configure this gear. We're going to get it all prepared. We're going to do loads of testing and get it all nestled into my home network really nicely and functioning super well for my video editing workflow. So I hope you've all enjoyed. I'll see you all in part two.